Hola, mi nombre es Mishka, soy cofundadora de la marca. Hola, soy María Victoria Conti, soy una directora italiana de 22 años. Ahí estamos aquí porque María Victoria está produciendo un cortometraje que sale en diciembre sobre el trastorno de bipolaridad. La conversación va a ser en inglés porque, como ya saben, María Victoria es italiana, pero nos pareció un tema tan interesante que ella está contando de una manera tan maravillosa y algo tan importante de lo cual se habla tan poco que quisimos igualmente hacer la entrevista. Así que nos vamos a pasar el inglés. Quien quiera igualmente ver esta entrevista y no habla inglés van a ver subtítulos en esta conversación. Así que bienvenidos. My film Gray Area is a short film about bipolar disorder and it tells the story of Harper, who is a girl that suffers from bipolar disorder and has decided to leave the extremes of her condition without, um, by rejecting any kind of medication. She lives a chaotic life made of ups and downs because during the ups, which is the mania part of the, of the disorder, she feels like truly herself. She sees it as a superpower. And so she only sees the depression and the lows as a compromise. And the film looks at three chapters of bipolar disorder in the life of Harper and uh, in general disorder, which are mania, depression and therapy. And in the, um, the story told by her the entire time, and she takes you through her life, um, showing you how she came to the conclusion and her decision to get into therapy, to live with the disorder and accept herself for what she is, because Like the title says, gray area, there's, there's the black and the white of this, of this uh, very intricate protagonist, uh, and uh, she's both, she's not just one. I think bipolar disorder is something that isn't that talked about, and that's the reason why you are doing what you're doing. So can you tell us a bit about yourself and wh why you started this project? Absolutely, okay. A uh, little overview about myself. Uh, I went to film school for university in Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University and I got my degree in film and TV production. And in my last year I was asked to make a thesis film, which is a short film, usually around 15 minutes. So for this time I decided to make a film inspired by someone who is really close to me, but about the topic of bipolar disorder. So um, I partnered up with this friend of mine uh, who has she has bipolar disorder she has had bipolar disorder for the past uh, eight years she was mm. diagnosed when she was 22 oh. and uh, in her case it was um, uh, it was triggered by um, substance abuse so just to give you a little insight I'm going to give you a little definition of what bipolar disorder is bipolar disorder is a mental disorder that causes unusual shifts in mood activity levels uh, concentration levels and even the ability to carry out day-to-day -day tasks it can be partly caused by specific brain circuits uh, but at times it can also be triggered by substance abuse or traumatic experiences the catch of this film and of this story is that my protagonist Harper loved being bipolar uh, because of of the highs, uh, of the mania, and uh, she only saw the, the downs uh, as a compromise. Mm -hmm. So we partnered up to write it, because uh, okay. uh, I'm mostly more of a director and And she wrote the script? Myself. Together we wrote it. Okay. Wow. I would say she wrote it as a book uh, and I transformed it into a script. Okay. Uh, wow, fascinating. But I would say that the structure kind of resembles a documentary because it's divided in three main chapters. Mania, depression and therapy, which are also the main chapters of bipolar, oh, bipolar disorder. Okay. You were telling us a little bit about, about the, the disorder itself. Can you tell us what the symptoms are or how, did, how does it present itself? Uh, so, it's a tricky question because the thing about bipolar disorder is that most people that are bipolar, you can't really tell they're bipolar. But uh, the main characteristics are um, mood swings, uh, not daily, can be throughout months and months uh, of uh, highs and lows. The highs being mania, so incredible energy, creativity, not out of sleep uh, even. Just um, your body's excited all the time and wants to do stuff. It's something that happens in the inside. So that's why on the outside, you can't really tell you too much. Because you know, if um, every person has uh, moments when they're happier and when they're, they're more sad. So, but for them, it's just, um, they can't really control it. So I was saying mania, and then uh, the other big characteristic is depression. Okay. So moments of lows where, um, you know, uh, maybe they can't even stand up from the bed for months uh, and don't even want to go to the bathroom. But um, in general, they live in a balance of this. As I was saying, it can be triggered. 
So in the case of my protagonist, uh, it was triggered by drug abuse, uh, and I'm not even talking about uh, hard drugs, uh, even something like marijuana could trigger it, or hard alcohol, uh, or mm. a bad sleep, uh, sleep schedule, or anything like that, and it would trigger for her the mania. After months, uh, or weeks, depends, uh, it changes every time, uh, of mania, um, she would go into a, a low uh, depression, a low state. depression, and then it just keeps going. The thing is that uh, in her specific case, uh, she was followed by a psychiatrist, but she wasn't listening to him. So, uh, so the medication was avoided. Um, the medication was only needed in the beginning of the episode, which usually they call it a psychotic episode, which is when. Um, there is something that triggers it and there's a couple of days of complete uh, unbalance in your brain and uh, even for them to, to completely remember and understand what was going on in psychotic episode, it's kind of hard and that uh, can only be treated with medicines. So that would, when she would go to a clinic, uh, get the help that she needed and then it would start the, the process. The process. Yeah, well, from what I read, for, for there's a series of things and there's no diagnosis like a direct exam but the diagnosis is through a therapist or a, psycho a specialist. And for it to be diagnosed um, bipolar disorder, it, there has to be a psychotic episode. That's what I mean. Exactly. So from the psychotic episode, they get the medicines and then uh, if they follow it, uh, my movie doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> In the case that they don't follow it, uh, uh, she lived uh, seven years uh, of Without. a con continuous oscillation between a mania, depression wow. and psychotic episodes. Without With medicine? Just for a little bit. Okay. Because I also, and we can get in depth about this later, but the thing about uh, the medication that it's needed after a psychotic episode is that, you know, you can feel dizzy and not really yourself. Uh, there can be weight gain, uh, uh, weight loss. Uh, uh, sleepiness, uh, you can't even drive sometimes uh, from the amount of how strong these medicines are. And so for her, the beginning is set, uh, it's, it's a lot. Then you would get used to it, but she never wanted to get used to it because of how bad it felt at first, and so she would abandon it. She was always followed by the psychiatrist, but didn't really listen to what she had to do. And the most important thing was that uh, in order for her to start a real journey to feel better and live with bipolar disorder, because it's totally possible to live with it, is that you do have to let go of certain things. In her case, it would be of her drugs or uh, the craziness, the party life, uh, which uh, can be done, but in measure. This happened throughout her whole twenties, and it's the time where it's the time where you want to go crazy and do your and live the fullest. Uh, but and she did, and she doesn't regret it. But at the same time, uh, the way she lived it brought her to the end, uh, which was uh, two years ago, where she had her last psychotic episode, uh, followed by a depression, and. Um, after that, uh, there was a big conversation uh, between her family and the friends and all that, where this was the first time that she chose uh, to go to the psychiatrist. And, and go through the... Exactly. Because before it was always uh, people uh, pushing, around, yeah. exactly, pushing her to get better. The thing with, with mental health in general is that it has, it has to come from you. You know, you can't go into therapy if you don't want to go to, into therapy. Wow. So... Um, and, and regarding all of this, and I'm learning so much about everything that you're telling me, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions around bipolar disease? The thing is that bipolar disorder has been shown in media, but it has not been shown in the, correctly. In the accurate way. It's yeah. been shown incorrectly. They us they're usually portrayed as aggressive or as, you know, like I said, laughing and crying within even the same hour. And um, of course, uh, very... Um, up and down all the time, uh, not reliable, uh, kind of, uh, which this is a word that uh, I use very carefully, uh, which is crazy. Okay. That's... Because uh, the misconception is that who is bipolar is crazy in general, because, you know, from the outside, uh, when you see someone into a manic episode or in a, in a depressive episode, you might uh, think that something is going on or um, Especially during mania, it can almost be uh, seen as, as if they're on drugs, in okay. a way. Usually everybody goes through highs and downs. How's the mania? The mania okay. can be, for example, they go to bed at 3 a.m., wake up at 5. 
And at five, they take not one coffee, five coffees, uh, and then they go on a run, and then they go do something else, and maybe they start pottery, maybe they start a painting. Mm -hmm. so, so it's very high energy. Exactly, and very... they just have, they're kind of bombarded by ideas and energy and want to do so much, uh, and uh, a lot of partying, music. Music really helps. In my film, music is one of the biggest components uh, because uh, for her, it, um, it would kind of put her in the mood. From the outside, I mean, of course, and now that, you know, I know this person and we talk about, and she talks to me about it and we talk about it, we can even laugh about it at times, but um, it only comes now after years and years of, uh, of working understanding, on it. exactly. Well, and, and it's part of what normalize, telling the story to normalize it, to, it's not something that's unimportant, but it's something that should be talked about and exactly. seen as normal so you can discuss it and it's probably easier for her now that She's more open about it. Oh, absolutely. I told the kind of like, a, I would say a year in the life of a bipolar person. Okay. Similar to what this... What does it look like? Exactly, to this case of bipolar, because okay. uh, there's so many uh, different different, yes, different yes. ways that it can that it can come out and, uh, and, put, and show itself. So this is what I want to make really clear is that this is one specific sorry, case. story. Yeah, exactly, of someone that suffers. From bipolar disorder. I also wanted to ask you um, about the reasons or, or why this disorder happens in people. Like, is it genetic or is it the environment? What's the story? Uh, it's very possible that if in a family there's a history of any kind of um, bipolar disorder or mental health in general, it can be shown uh, in the in the next generations. But it can also, like I said in the beginning, it can also be triggered by a traumatic experience or substance abuse in this particular case. Uh, it can be shown in different ways and uh, in different points of life. It usually, someone is not born with it. It comes out uh, during your teenage years or your early 20s. So yes, yeah, it triggers probably. Exactly. Like, as I was, from what I read, it's, you have certain genes in a bipolar person has certain genes that they can, that, that are part of bipolar, which are, as you said, um, anxiety, depression, and other things that can be passed on. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna have this condition, but there are certain things in the environment that can trigger them as did exactly. the alcohol, or, or as you're saying, traumatic experience, extreme stress, etc. Sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation. Well, as I wanted to, ask you how do you think that talking about it makes it call it better or easier or helps in a way people who have this condition oh it absolutely does uh, talking about it because you know it spreads awareness uh, and uh, for people that know nothing about it uh, they can start you know to spark an interest in them to want to know more about it or in the case of my film it's very interesting because when i was putting together the crew to make it uh, uh, of course, I was pitching this as, you know, it's a story about mental health uh, and it's taken from a personal experience of, uh, of a polar disorder. And every one of my team ended up being someone that had a close person in their life too that had suffered from some kind of mental disorder. And so they really felt like in order to help these people that they love so much, they wanted to be a part of this. But also, um, it's important for people that don't know anyone yet that have it. Or maybe they do. I think I was going to say that. I think that we all probably know someone that has some sort of of mental uh, condition and educating yourself on these are the first step into seeking help and finding tools for yourself or for the people around you so i think that talking about it and making documentaries and having conversations and just even describing how these things feel because if we don't talk about it how are we going to put our finger on top of this is what I'm feeling, this is what I have, and this is what I can do about it. It's important. Exactly, and the thing is that you have to listen. If it's not something that you suffer from it directly, but you want to know more about it, just listen. No judgment, no nothing. Because, you know, most of the stories from the outside, they can be seen as, uh, you know, life decisions that maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't have done, but who are you to... Uh, to judge. Exactly, you didn't know what, how they felt, and that's why I'm trying to make this, to have people understand how they felt. I think what's really interesting is that uh, for for her it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a therapy to do this because she was able to look over 10 years of her life and put them on paper from the outside now that she felt uh, good and she wasn't <laughs> on any uh, you know 
in any in any episode when she did this. She had been uh, this was done two years after she um, hadn't had any kind of uh, episode uh, or, or exactly of any episode. And um, yeah, I absolutely think that it's it's about conversation, sparking. Um, and since we're talking about this, about it being talked about, it not being talked about, I think that not in our generation, but in past generations, talking about mental health probably taboo. People think that there is a stigma. There is a stigma. They're sort of marginalized. But I wanted to ask, like, can they lead a normal life? Oh, absolutely. They can live. A, they can absolutely lead a normal life. But uh, you know, like, like any kind of condition, you have to. Uh, um, to have a different kind of lifestyle, to be able to live with it and um, do everything that you want. Um, in this specific case, you know, she had to kind of change her lifestyle in the way of, uh, you know, in the weekend you want a glass of wine, a drink, go for it. But it's not something that should have been abused. It started off with just a, a little change in the lifestyle, and then of course it was partnered up with uh, a specific medicine or. You know, a lot of um, mental health can be even be can, can even be dealt with uh, in a more, um, let's say, less scientific way through meditation, it's yoga. Like yeah. There's and I think it's a lot of what we what we talk about here is that there's no like we all need to adapt our lifestyles to the kind of person that we are and the conditions that we have. As I was saying, mental health is something more common than in like. Having different conditions and issues and ups and downs is much more common that we, than we talk about and that we think that it is. It doesn't mean that you have to paralyze your life and then if you have something, just stop and, and, and retrieve yourself and lock yourself at home. It just means that you need to understand what you have and, and exactly. try to adapt. Exactly. Find a, find a balance. It's all about finding a balance. It's not that uh, this person had to completely stop being herself. She just had to... Um, tune down the extremes. She has very healthy relationships with her family and her partner and uh, in her job she found again a way to to be you know to be successful without always having the fear of will they know that I'm bipolar. So in a way uh, completely accepting and uh, I would say also um, uh, like you know giving you a pat on the shoulder and be like uh, it's okay what you did and you know now you can uh, you don't have to be ashamed. Yeah, you can lead a normal life. Exactly. Yeah. What is the tr normal treatment for for this disorder? And from your research and experience, what do you think helps the most? Um, so first of all, you have to be um, followed by a psychiatrist and a psychologist to start a, an actual journey of living with bipolar disorder and uh, of medication and all that. But um, most of the case, uh, in the like I, I t talked about it briefly before, in the psychotic episode uh, part of the disorder, of course you will need to go into medication, which your psychiatrist will give to you. But in the day-to-day -day life, you have um, meetings with your psychiatrist, and I would say weekly or bi-weekly meetings with your therapist. And um, if you're doing good and uh, you know you don't have any uh, highs or lows for a long period of time, um, they can even take out some of the harder medication and go with uh, the... This is kind of like the universal medication for uh, bipolar disorder, which is lithium. Lithium is a natural mineral that it's all in, our, it's in everyone's brain, but for people who are bipolar, it can be very low. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a, a pill that, that you take and uh, it balances it out so that you don't have any um, Compensate so any going uh, going below or going over any yeah, discompensation. Exa exactly. Uh, so that's the in the case of my protagonist and uh, my friend, uh, it was uh, the, um, the cure. <laughs> Call it cure. The the way to live with it. So it's not any like she can do everything. It's not a hard type of medication, and um, you know, um, yeah. Um, how do you think? lifestyle and what lifestyle changes or things can affect either positively or negatively on bipolar disease. Okay. In a more positive way, uh, you know, meditation, yoga, a good nutrition and, um, and therapy can be things that can make it better. 
All of that can make it, yeah. I all, all of that can uh, affect uh, in the better way and uh, a, more, um, a more chaotic lifestyle such as sleep deprivation, alcohol abuse, uh, nicotine, uh, uh, drugs, uh, all of that can be triggers to make it worse. Oh goodness, so goodness. in this specific case, uh, just by cutting uh, an excessive amount of uh, nicotine, alcohol and drug abuse... Uh, Which are stressors for the, for, for the body and exactly, for the brain at the end of the exactly. day. Exactly, just this uh, and uh, also during mania one thing for my protagonist was that uh, uh, her eating schedule was very, uh, very weird, you know. Sometimes when you're, this happens to me even when I'm in my creative uh, part, like when I was making this film, uh, I needed friends to tell me, oh, drink some water, <laughs> eat something. Because when you're very into, into some, you know, you're very energetic and excited about something, you forget. You forget. So taking care of your body and your mind uh, is something that can definitely uh, make a difference in the everyday life. Depends. And of course, uh, always uh, continuing with, uh, with the therapy and uh, I put, they say that's fundamental like it's, the it's medication un, exactly. with, even when you feel therapy. better because even right now that it's been two years since um, uh, since my protagonist last psychotic episode and uh, manic and depressive episode she still goes to therapy exactly it's a journey it's a process uh, it doesn't start or end uh, when you just feel the first day better or the day that you go to bed not even thinking about it so it's good to make it a lifestyle how do you think it affects the people living with someone who has this condition and what would you and what do you think is important to keep in mind for these people um, I think it, I think it's hard. It's hard also for the people outside of it because uh, you want to help, but sometimes it's not your place to help or to say certain things. But uh, in my case, uh, it's really important to support in any ways that you can. The thing with people with mental health is that sometimes they don't want to even talk about it or open up because they think you're going to treat them differently once you tell them. So in my experience, uh, um, I never treated this person differently. I always saw her as a person, not as someone with bipolar disorder. And, and in that way, when I got mad about certain things that she did or ways that she made me feel, I told her and I opened up about it. Then if there was a, also from her side wanting to go deeper and talk about it, okay. But if it didn't come from her, I can't force her. But the thing is that you have to support them no matter what and of course not judge them. Because um, something that may seem so simple to us uh, may not be for them or they maybe they haven't come to that point of understanding yet. So from the outside, uh, uh, you can just be close to them and of course uh, uh, let them open up if they want. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a really deep connection and a safe space to be able to, to talk about it. But yeah, from the outside, it can be a little... Uh, you can, you can feel alone too, because you know, maybe you want to go to someone else and describe the way that it's make, it making you feel, but the other person does not have someone in their life that has something like that. So in my case, it felt very, um, I felt like I wasn't powerful enough. I, not powerful enough, I couldn't do anything to help and I really wanted to. But then uh, throughout this film, I found out uh, that uh, just by being there, I was helping. Yeah. Uh, for them, it's a thing, for you, it's another, uh, it's a process and together you can, uh, you can find a balance. Regarding the short film, you said it was coming out in December, hopefully. Yeah. When it does, where can we watch this? Okay, so uh, I will be sending this to various film festivals, mm -hmm. but uh, it will be available on Vimeo. Okay, on your site that we will probably share in this space around here somewhere. And if you want to know updates uh, and behind the scenes, uh, you can uh, follow our Instagram page uh, and our crowdfunding page. Of course, the crowdfunding is finished, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be here talking about the film. But uh, we, uh, we post updates on there too, and you can kind of get uh, more insight of what was the process behind it, and even a more uh, technical side of uh, um, how we made the film. So, um, thank you so much for telling us and the story and opening up for, to us and for caring and making a short film about such an important issue. We also wanted to ask you a few questions about yourself, not related to, to the short film or to the topic of, of mental health. And since you're in film, we wanted to ask for a movie and um, any advice that you have regarding mental health or health in general for our community. 
Okay, so for the movie, I recommend a movie that also inspired me to make this film, which is uh, Silver Linings Playbook, and um, which is on bipolar disorder, if you, if you didn't know. <laughs> and uh, for the advice, uh, being someone that suffers from anxiety, what really helped me was uh, uh, going into meditation and um, not being scared to ask to go to therapy. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yes. Great. So, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for, as I said, opening up to us and telling us the story about Grey Area and your personal story as well with your experience with it. And thank you everybody for listening, tuning in, and I hope when the film comes out, you are able to go watch it on her site. Thank you so much for the opportunity and I'm so happy to have talked about this. And my Instagram for updates on the film is uh, Grey Area Short, in case you want to know more about uh, our process behind the camera and what we're doing right now. Thank you. Yeah.